Hi there, I'm Renee Brack and this is a very special episode of Movie Juice because I get to screen my favourite interviews of 2008 for you. So I'll count them down from 10 to 1. And coming in at number 10 is Jason Statham. He came to Australia to talk to me about his best movie of the year, The Bank Job, about the real life robbery that netted millions and could have brought down the UK monarchy. I was told he was prickly and brief, so don't be offended. But he wasn't, and so I wasn't. Here's who I sometimes think is the UK's answer to Bruce Willis, the beautifully bald Jason Statham. Now, you've done a few heist movies. Is there a What in particular attracts you to those kinds of scripts? Uh, well, particularly this one, I wanted to make a film back in London, and, you know, I hadn't done one for quite some time since, uh, you know, it had been several years since I worked with Guy Ritchie. And uh, this seemed like a, you know, a unique story, you know, it's a robbery, but it wasn't so much about the, uh, the robbery itself, it was more about what happened after the robbery. And, um, you know, the interesting fact is, although we're the criminals making this, you know, this robbery at the time, the most, we're, we end up being the most innocent people involved in this whole thing. And, you know, these guys, they, 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 they sort of go in there, they're not sort of going in there with machine guns and balaclavas, they're not sticking, you know, barrels up anybody's nose and, you know, they're not like violent criminals, they're just uh, tunnelling in, sneaking out and getting away with something that, um, you know, they really shouldn't be having. Well, someone shouldn't be hiding, put it that way. Ordinary decent criminals. Ordinary decent criminals. Couldn't say anything more <laughs> uh, useful. Holy shit. You know who that is. Oh, well, we're in the crapper, Jerry. It was in my safety deposit box. Photographs of a certain royal princess. You've instigated this calamity by storing your blackmail materials in this bank. If we don't get onto the case quickly, God knows what will happen to our photographs. What did you know about the robbery prior to doing the film? Because it is one of the lesser known ones, but it's actually netted heaps more dough and loot than any of the others. It's hard to sort of recount what happened because, like I said, you know, there was, you know, four days of media coverage, so it is kind of strange. So you have to ask the question, why did they, you know, why did they put a gag to the press? I mean, what was the, uh, the reasons behind Behind that, so you know, you, you don't have to put two and two together. You, you do realise that there was, you know, at the time there was someone that was using blackmailing materials. You know, the the, the political side, the scandal for, that they were providing with all the, you know, the prostitutes and the brothels that they were in and out of, and you just, uh, you know, you understand what was in those uh, boxes, and uh, you know, you un you understand why that gag was put upon the press. Did you see the photos? I'm not saying whether I did or I didn't. <laughs> I'm not going to put myself right in the frame. I saw something. <laughs> did you see who was in the photo? Uh, next question. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to sit here all night making small talk. I know you, Terry. And I know your mates. You've always been looking for the big score. The one that makes sense of everything. I liked your character's name too because it sounded like um, doing the impossible tearing leather. Because it would be. Tearing leather, yeah. It would be a very tough thing to be able to do. It's quite a tough name, isn't it? Tearing it is. leather. <laughs> <laughs> You're very, very good at playing a tough guy. Well, it's all, it's all, it's all trickery, camera trickery and uh, movie magic, that's all. You know, I'm a big softie deep down. You get all your nasty pictures, we get indemnity. And we want it signed, sealed, and delivered by a public figure. How about the Prime Minister? Yeah, you'll do, if you can drag him off his yacht. I've seen this face before. He's an MP. <laughs> Coming in at number nine of my favourite interviews of 08 is a little-known filmmaker, Matt Norman, and his first feature, a documentary about his uncle, Peter Norman. He was the Australian Olympic athlete who was on the winner's dais with the two African-American athletes who raised their fists in the air, taking a stand against racial inequality. It took a lot of passion and commitment to make a film like this, especially when no one seemed to care. It's called Salute, and it helped everyone to remember and everyone to care. Who the hell is he? Peter Norman. Peter Norman. Peter Norman. Peter Norman is flying on the outside. Salute is the story of a forgotten man. Who was he and why was he forgotten? Um, I suppose in this country, um, back in 1968, it wasn't very cool to um, be standing up for the black man of society. And, and 
even though Peter has uh, the record for Australia still after 40 years, he's always been that person that's been forgotten. Because as soon as you say the name Peter Norman to the Olympic Committee, you're pretty much starting to say something about civil human rights. And I think um, a lot of people like to shut that side of him down so that uh, he doesn't get that opportunity. So that's pretty much why I'm here, to give him that opportunity back. I think the, the whole journey behind this film for me was to to show Australians that, number one, we had an Australian that got a silver medal in, in an Olympic Games in an event that is usually dominated by black America. Um, and it's something to be proud of as a sports hungry country that we are. Um, but secondly, that he stood up for the right of mankind to be exactly the same, no matter what colour or what race or what country. It's not just an historical documentary, it's a very emotional film. Have you been with audiences and experienced what yeah. the feeling in the room and what is that feeling? Watching people cry in the film every single time it's been on um, is weird, is very weird. But, you know, it, it, I suppose the upsetting thing for me is that I would have loved Peter to be uh, there to watch because that's, that's upsetting for me because I did this for him. I didn't do it to make money. I didn't do it for international acclaim. I did a film for an uncle that I love um, and to show him off to all my new friends. It's a pleasure for me to know Peter and it's a pleasure for my people to know Peter now. When Morgan Spurlock asked where in the world is Osama bin Laden, then went on an international excursion to go find him, I wanted to talk to him about the journey. We caught up a couple of years earlier when he made Super Size Me, so I knew I was in for a good time during the interview. Here's number eight in my pick of the best interviews of 2008, Morgan Spurlock. Yoo-hoo, Osama! If I've learned anything from big budget action movies, it's that complicated global problems are best solved by one lonely guy. What made you think you were up to it? Why not? Yeah, why couldn't I? You know, it's like uh, I'm like the guy who, you know, bought the lottery ticket. You know, it's like you don't buy a lottery ticket saying I'm going to lose. You buy a lottery ticket saying, hey, maybe, maybe I'm the guy. And so uh, we thought, let's give it a shot. Why not? What would have been the first thing you would have said to him? I said, what is wrong with you? What is your problem? No, Don't you have. think that's a bit too um, globo cop American? Yeah, but, but yeah, of course. No, the, the, the thing we would have asked him, which we talked about, you know, myself and Daniel, our DP, talk about all the time, like, what, do, what are we going to say when we go there? And and the big, the first question, that, the, the question, the biggest question I have is just like, how does this all, how does all the crazy end? How does it stop? How can we get to the point where all this just goes away? This is hardcore Taliban country. There's 21 guys here with guns. When whoever's escorting us says, let's go, it means go now. Go now! It's important to the US that um, Osama bin Laden is kept alive in some at least mythological form, isn't it? I think uh, in a post-Cold War world, it's great to have a bad guy. You know, now that the Russians are gone and the big boogeyman's gone, you need a new boogeyman. And what better boogeyman than one who's like this individual now who's almost more than a man, who's impossible to capture, who's everywhere and nowhere, like Kaiser Soze and the usual suspects, you know, he's the, the guy who strikes fear in the hearts of men. And not only that, he's got people in countries all around the world that are just waiting to attack, you know, it's, that's scary. So this is a good moisturizer? Yeah. It'll keep my hands really soft? Yeah. yeah. And do you know where I could find Osama Bin Laden? We're almost halfway through my countdown of the 10 best movie juice interviews I did in 2008. There are six more to go, so keep watching Movie Extra to see some of the world's biggest stars cut loose and get chatty. I'll see you next time.